Exodus 13, verse 14. If you're looking in your Bible, say, I'm there. If you're looking at the jumbo chan, say, I'm cheating. And the, and the cheaters have it. Here we go. And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come. In time to come. Saying, what is this? Thou shalt say to him, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. Chapter 13 of Exodus, verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a, pal in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way. Everyone say, a cloud. And by night, a pillar of fire. Everyone say fire. fire. To give them light to go. That way they could follow him day and night. And I'm going to tell you, he, he will still lead us day and night if we'll let him. I want to go, I want to go now, if you will, our last Scripture, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, the last one that I'll use before we're seated because I would like to draw my, my text from it. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with that temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Now they didn't know that I was preaching about the wilderness when they got up and started singing about the wilderness. But I'm not surprised because God just does that a lot. And so I want to preach for a few minutes about the way. Just, I, I just want to preach about the way here today and tell somebody God knows where you're at. And if you'll let him, he's going to get you through this. I want you to lift your hands and I want everybody in the building, if you will, to pray, to seek God. We heard in our adult class from Sister Matthews about seeking him. Let's seek him for a few minutes right now. Come on, every voice lifted from the youngest to the oldest. If you don't know what else to say, just begin to tell the Lord that you love him. Oh, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Come on, somebody tell him that you need him. Somebody tell him that you trust him. Lord, we love you. We give you thanks. Before you're seated, say it with me. There's a way to escape. There's a way to escape. God bless you. You may be seated. Now before you pull out your clippers or your filer, let me try to keep your attention with a story. Many of you that watch the news or maybe you read business, maybe you just spend too much time on YouTube, I don't know, but you've possibly ran across and seen the image of the individual on the screen portrayed behind me. His name is Tom Suker. Tom Stuker is a individual that's got a lot of notoriety. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but when I fly, those aren't the chairs I get. If you've if you have flown and been in chairs like that, I don't even want you to raise your hand because people around you will feel a little different level of disdain. I don't want envy. I don't want jealousy to creep up in this room. But Tom Stuker's an individual who in 1990 took advantage of something that was presented by United Airlines. They came out with the opportunity to buy a lifetime pass for flying. Well, man, that's a good deal. Well, here's the catch. It was $290,000. And then you could buy a companion pass, which is what he did. So in 1990, Tom Stuker invested $500,000. So as you can imagine, he was already doing okay. At least financially. 
He invested $500,000 into United Airlines. But as a result, the picture of that guy right there on the screen, Mr. Tom Stuker, has acquired more miles than any other human being on the face of the earth. Over 23 million miles have been flown by the now 69-year-old Tom Stuker. And in his recent interview, he told the Washington Post, it was the best decision financially in my life. Wow. I don't know if you're like me, I don't want to be in the air that much. He fell in love with Australia, and in the interview, he told them he'd been to Australia over 300 times. He's gone to other countries for lunch. One of the last times they went to Australia, they stayed three hours in Australia to go to a particular place, and then they got back on the plane. He said, if I ever get to within a week and I haven't been on a plane, I feel as though I'm out of place. There's a destination to get to. If you're like me and you travel any at all, he can have all those miles and he can have all those airports. But what he did was he unlocked, as it were, some of us would, would recognize the term that they used in the article, the golden ticket. He found the golden ticket that enables him. And, and along all the flights, it's not just that he's flown over 23 million miles, but he's also figured out how to play the system of gathering and racking up points. You can gather up frequent flyer miles for for something he had already paid in for a long time ago, he has racked up frequent flyer miles and figured out how to sell them. Brother How one day he took his frequent flyer miles that he had cashed in on Walmart gift cards and spent $50,000 in one day at Walmart. You gotta be working to spend $50,000. I feel some of you in the room, I could do it. I could do it. I could do it today. I feel somebody. I feel people. I feel people. At one point, he cashed in 490,000 Flymeyer points so that he could be on the episode uh, of a particular sitcom, so that he could just be an extra setting in a booth so that he could make it onto the small screen, as it were. All of this... But if you would sit down and you would talk to Tom Stuker about all of the destinations, all of the countries, he's been in over a hundred different countries as the result of this and has a job that allows him to travel. But if you, if you had the opportunity to sit down and he could list off the hundred plus countries that he's been in and all of the destinations that he has eaten at and all of the areas that he has traveled to, he would have to tell you there is no destination without the journey. There is no destination without the journey. I've come today on what I feel is an assignment from the Lord to tell someone right here and right now, you are in the middle of a journey. And if you'll allow God He's going to turn what you have been calling a wilderness into the greatest way-making season of your life. Pastor, you're not, you're not yelling. We don't know. Are we supposed to? Do we clap for that? Or is that, a, is that a throwaway? I want to say it very calmly so that no one misses it. I'm going to say it again. Some of you are, what you, you are in what you have determined is the worst season of your life. And I showed up on this Sunday morning to tell you if you'll let him, he's going to turn this wilderness season into the greatest testimony of your entire life. And what the devil is trying to get credit out of, God is going to turn around. And if you'll let him, he is going to bless you and use you in spite of it. Are you okay with that as a foundation? Can you handle that? I want to read you a scripture here today just so that you know that we're not making this up. Just so that you know that this isn't something that, that I've just concocted. But the choir just sang and they sang from the prophet Isaiah. If you don't know, what they were singing was from the prophet. In Isaiah chapter 43, 
In Isaiah 43 and 19, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Turn in your Bibles. We're going to do a little Bible study for a moment in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now, I'm starting slow. Don't worry. I'm not going to preach very long. But we're going to be super intentional for the first little bit here. We're going to do Bible study for a few moments, and we're going to read through these 10 verses. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years. Everyone say 40 years. In where? The wilderness. Here's what we don't like. To humble thee. Blech. And to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And how many know in the wilderness there was a proving that there were some who were only fair weather saints? And he humbled thee and he suffered thee to hunger. But because you were suffered to hunger, you were fed with manna which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know that the man doth not live by bread only. How many know that sounds a little bit like the New Testament? But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thine raiment wax not old upon thee. That's a miracle. Neither did thy foot swell. That's a real miracle, especially if any of them got pregnant, right? Come on now. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways. Everybody say, walk in his ways. And to fear him. Everyone say, fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains, and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil from the olive and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Wow. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, everyone say full, then shalt thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. For you to study the geography of the exodus of the Old Testament when the children of Israel are in captivity under the oppressing rule of the Egyptians. We read in Exodus 1 and we read in Exodus 2 that there arose a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph and there was a change in the demeanor of the land. There was a change in the position and the stance of the land. And any favoritism or any blessing that had been handed down from a previous generation had now turned into the taskmasters and the harsh reality against the children of God that were living in Egypt. Hear me this morning. What most of you know, be reminded. And those who do not know, hear it for the first time. The Bible says that as they begin to oppress them even greater and harder for fear of them, for fear of them, for fear of them, boy, I feel that in my spirit, because the Egyptians knew how powerful the people of God really were. If only the people of God could get in their minds how powerful they really were. And so the Egyptians begin to oppress them at a greater level, and you know it, but be reminded or hear it for the first time if you don't. They begin to afflict them all the more. The Bible says the taskmasters begin to afflict them all the more. But the more that they did afflict them, the more that the Israelites grew and they multiplied and they prospered. It was in complete 
contrary belief to what the Egyptians had set out this plan to do. They thought the more we oppress them, the more they will be weakened. But it turned out because they were the people of God, the more they were afflicted, the more they bound together and worked together and they were strengthened and they were multiplied. I want to take a pause at the beginning of this message and say it doesn't have to make sense on paper. It just has to make sense in the economy of God. I've come today, I feel very strongly from the Lord that there are people in this room that feel as though you have been under the oppression of your enemy for long enough. You have felt the weightiness of the task management. You have felt the weightiness of the enemy's ploy against you. It's against your mind. It's against your heart. It's against your spirit. If I was starting a Bible study today about the New Testament, I think I would want to start in Exodus of the Old Testament and prove to every person, listen, it's always been the plan of God to bring his people out of the bondage of sin, out from the world. I know it's just a Sunday morning in July, but I wonder if somebody still believes he brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He brought me out from the world. That's why we... That's why we cannot spend our time looking at Egypt, thinking about what Egypt has to offer. Egypt has nothing to offer for people that are... Egypt has nothing to offer for the people of God. I'm not looking for their taskmasters. I'm not looking for their affliction. I'm not looking to build their bricks or make their homes or construct their walls. I'm not looking for them to give me a little slop in a bucket and tell me I'm blessed. Give me a little slop in the bucket and we're going to watch Israel. They're going to go up and down and say, you could have left us in Egypt. They're going to murmur against Moses. But the Lord had greater plans for them. I feel like telling somebody today, the Lord has greater plans for you than you to pull up to an Egyptian slop bucket and act like you got to live with a mind that's half gone and live with a body that can't find strength and live with a marriage that can't find continuity and rest. The devil is a liar. Egypt is not your home. Egypt is not your task. Let me break it for anybody missing it. This world is not our home. We are passing through as pilgrims. Our treasures are laid up. They're laid up. And so I do not look at the slop of the Egyptians and think, whoo, what a blessing it is. Elbow your neighbor and tell them, I ain't eating slop. Throw some bucket down before me after I've worked hard making bricks for houses I can't live in. <laughs> oh, I'd like to run with that. Building walls to keep people like me out and keep people like me in. I'm building the bricks for the very definition of my own bondage. And then you want me to be thankful that you put a little slop down in front of me. But the Lord raised up a boy who would be the great leader of all time by the name of Moses and Moses would be lifted and he would be led. He would be placed in the original ark, that ark that would be built and would be placed there. That, that literally it was, a, it was an ark that was gonna be uh, there that was slimed and it had pitch and it was there from the bulrushes and Moses would be kept. You know the story. He would later walk into Pharaoh on a mission from God and stutter his way through and, 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 and the work was going to happen. But I need you to hear me here today. This is what I need us to hear. It's what I feel so strong. Their exodus was not going to be without a wilderness. Oh, Pastor Carson, they did that wilderness thing to themselves. Hmm. I believe that God was guiding them. I believe that God was directing them. I've read multiple commentaries that said they didn't take that direct route for a multitude of reasons. If you look at it geography, at the geography of it, they could have got to the promised land a whole lot quicker than. And I've heard people say, well, it's because they were just confused and they were just, tore there's a lot to it. I'm not gonna, we can read the text, there's a lot to it. But I'm gonna tell you, I've read multiple commentaries and I agree with them. Had they tried to get into the promised land before it was due time, they would have tried to fight a battle they weren't ready for. I wanna tell you here this morning, we better be careful that when we pick battles, they're ones he's put us into. 
When you pick a battle, you better make sure it's the Lord who puts you in that battle and not your flesh that wants to get it early. Better make sure. What did the wilderness teach them? I'm going to tell you what the wilderness taught them. I, there's nothing fun about the wilderness. There's nothing exciting about the wilderness. And I understand what the wilderness represents. But the Lord has challenged me to preach about the wilderness. And I didn't talk to Sister Gallia and whoever came up with this song. I didn't talk about it. I didn't know you were going to sing about the wilderness. But I didn't want to preach about the wilderness. And you sang about the wilderness. thought I better go ahead and preach about the wilderness. The wilderness isn't fun to preach about, but the Lord reminded me there are sides of him that you see in the wilderness that you don't see anywhere else. <laughs> I need maybe just a few elders that have been through some things that you didn't enjoy it when you went through it, but it taught you some things in that season of wilderness. You know you're stronger today because you came through the wilderness. Not just that you had a wilderness, but that you endured a wilderness. I there's hundreds of people in this room that went through seasons of your life you thought you'd never make it out of. You thought you'd never come through it. And there was an enemy of your soul with a slop bucket down before you telling you you might as well curse God and die. You might as well give up on your church family. You might as well quit being faithful. Look at what returning your tithes has got you. Look at what dressing and living holy has got you. Look at what all your faithful attendance to church has got you. You're sick like everybody else. You're depressed like everybody else. You're I'm talking to real people on a real Sunday in God's house. But I need some people that in spite of the wilderness and in spite of the devil's lies, in spite of the Egyptian asylum, you are here on this Sunday because you found out not only can he bring me to the wilderness, he can bring me through the wilderness. He can keep... How many know that he can not only bring you to but he can bring you through. I've come to tell somebody on a Sunday morning, if he brought you to it, he'll bring you through it. If he brought you to it, he's gonna bring you through it. Crazy story to read about clothes growing. But when you're in a wilderness, you're not as concerned about your fashion as you are just having something to put on. Shoes that are growing because the, I didn't cause your foot to swell. How do these old shoes still work? How could he possibly? How about in this, a wilderness will put you in a place where there is no provision. I wish it was not so, men and women of God. I wish it was not so. But sometimes we need barrenness to remember the blessing They get into a place where they're murmuring because there is no food until they walk out one day. Uh, it's on the, what's, who's the first person that ate it? <laughs> Come on, how many know it would have been one of your kids? I don't know if you know this or not. You probably wouldn't know this unless you've seen it posted somewhere. Uh, two days ago, we officially got in the dog game. We, 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 that means we bought a dog. That's what that means. We got in the, we bought a dog because we wanted it. We wanted a dog. And <laughs> we, we all wanted a dog. Oh, he's a cute, he's a cute little, cute little dog. Beautiful little dog. Beautiful little, beautiful little dog. But I found out, Brother Gallion and I found out, that dude will eat anything. he just eat anything up off the floor. Last night I was having to watch him. He's walking around, anything on the floor. Get it off the floor, get that off the floor, get that off the floor. My kids had water balloons. So get, 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 get that, put that away. My son looked at me and said, he ain't gonna eat a water balloon, I think he will. <laughs> How many know? I, mean, I heard elders just say, yes, they will. Yes, they will. Anything. Okay, before I ever had a dog, I had four kids. <laughs> and I found out that he just about, any, so I'm assuming, I don't know if it was one of the dogs, I don't know if it was one of the kids, but somebody who went ahead and tried it and the Lord had set it up. And the manna is a miracle and it's the provision of God. Now I'm gonna tell you this, it is the provision in God in, sp in spite of the people's waywardness. In spite of the people's waywardness. But even in their wilderness, you hear me, he was still their God. I don't know why you're in this wilderness. 
And if you hear nothing else I say, I don't know why you're in this season. God didn't give me some great magic word to tell you as to why you're in this season, why you're in this wilderness, but he did, he did prompt me, he did prompt me to share with you that if you let him, he will provide for you, he will keep you, he will sustain you, and he will bring you through this wilderness. If you're in a wilderness today, I want you to know he can make streams in the desert and he can make a way in this wilderness. Well, pastor, that's great, that's good, but I don't want a wilderness. Tell that to John the Baptist. John the Baptist didn't want a wilderness, but he got a wilderness. In fact, his ministry started in a wilderness. Man, man here it comes. He started in a wilderness and it was the launching pad of his ministry. How about Jesus Christ himself, God manifest in the flesh? How many remember where his ministry actually got started? He was in the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Brother Mack, it was not what his flesh wanted, but it was what his flesh needed. How can you say that about Jesus Christ? Because the Bible it tells us he was led in the wilderness, not just to be in the wilderness, but to be tempted of Satan. But how many know that his answer in that very temptation is what we just read from this book? It's the same answer from the Old Testament, tying together this exodus from the Old Testament to this exodus in the New Testament. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I've come to tell somebody very shortly, very quickly, and as clearly as I possibly can, if you want to serve the devil of your wilderness, a black eye, you ought to square your shoulders and tell hell today, I know know that you're trying to tempt me but I'm not going to live by bread alone but I'm going to live by the word of God and my word is this he's made me a way to escape he has made me a way to get through this I'm not saying it's going to be easy but if he has to he'll make my clothes grow if he has to he won't let my feet swell if he has to listen he'll drop quail from the sky and bring man from the ground, if he has to, he will. Here's my question. Is he as good in the wilderness as he... Is he as good in your wilderness? I'm speaking to somebody in the middle of family crisis right now, and I'm asking you a question. Is he as good in your wilderness as he is... Well, he, he was good. Somebody said it. He's better. The wilderness proves to me he's not just a good God when I'm in a good situation. The wilderness proves even when I get lost, he doesn't. Even when I get turned around, he never gets turned around. How can he possibly know where I'm at? Because on Wednesday night, we stood in here and talked about the I'm not, I'm not present God. How many remember that? And then we started talking about the omnipotent characteristic of God. How many remember, if you were here, if you weren't here, you ought to go back and watch it and pray at home. The Spirit of God flooded into this house when we begin to acknowledge who he was. And I've come to remind somebody today, he is bigger than your wilderness. He is greater than your struggle. I'm gonna tell you what I'm feeling right now. Man, I'm feeling, I felt it three times. I don't usually say it this, but I'm gonna say it, well, I probably do say it but I'm gonna really say it right now. You fighting your, with your wife is not your wilderness. The sin that's trying to destroy you is the wilderness. And it's got you in a season to get your eyes off of God and onto your frustration with each other. Boy, I'm in it right here. I'm in it right here, right now. And I'm in it for this reason to tell the devil, you're not getting our victory in this wilderness. You're not getting our families because of a season of wilderness. You're not taking this moment of confusion. Let me tell you what our way of escape is. Our way of escape is more than some cute poem or, 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 or some uh, do it 
quick get rich scheme. It's more than some uh, silent meditation where we try to make our minds feel better. I'm going to give you our answer. It's from 1 Corinthians that we read here today. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is Faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And I'm going to give you that way here today. John 14 and 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. I've got an answer for your modern day wilderness. Their answer in the Old Testament was that fire and it was that cloud. It was the presence of God that had to lead them. Why would you lead us right off the bat to a Red Sea? Unless I lead you to a Red Sea, you're going to get your you're going to get yourself into a way of thinking that you somehow did this on your own. I'm going to pull you out of Exodus by my power. I'm going to walk you across the Red Sea by my power. I'm going to give you clothes by my power. I'm going to keep your shoes on your feet by my power. I'm going to let there be manna by my power. I'm going to let there be quail by my power. I'm going to make water flow from the rock by my power. You murmur all you want to, but it'll be by my power. And we get into the New Testament, and it is the same thing continual cycle of people that are up and down and John walked into the wilderness and when the wilderness should have beat him down instead of letting the wilderness destroy him he went into the wilderness and said prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight John what are you talking about you don't have anything but some camels fur and you got locusts in your mouth and honey on your lips you don't look like you're doing that well John but John said prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his path straight. This is not about me having some kind of social uh, leadership that you think I look like I got a nice chariot and got the finest duds. Even in a wilderness, I'm gonna be a preacher. Even in a wilderness, I'm going to be the forerunner of Christ. I've come to tell you that if you can be a forerunner of Christ in the wilderness, then you can be the forerunner of Christ anywhere in any situation. And Jesus was led into the wilderness. And this should have been the place where he gave in. Give in. You're hungry. You've been fasting for 40 days. He's fasted for 40 days and was afterward and hungered. I don't even feel like that part of the scripture was necessary. He's hungry. And the tempter shows up. I'm talking to people right now who you've got on your nice suit and you came here with your hair did if you've got any. But the tempter has been standing at your door. He's been standing at your wilderness door and he's been saying, come on. Come on, come on, give in, give in, give in. And our example is the example of Christ. You're not going to tempt the Lord thy God. You're not going to tempt them. You're not going to tempt him. You're not going to prosper. He carries him up. There's three different temptations. And his answer to the temptations was the word of God. And because he uses the word of God, finally, at that third temptation, how many remembers what the Lord Jesus says to Satan? Get, get the, get, anybody remember? Maybe you didn't sing this. When I was a kid, we sang this uh, old song. I command thee, Satan, in the name of the Lord. I feel a few of you. To pick up your weapons and flee. For God has given me authority to walk. How many kids have never heard that song? You've never, how many has never heard it? Just raise your hand if you've never heard that song. Awesome. Look how many hundred people. Well, you're about to get educated right here, okay? <laughs> I command thee, Satan, in the name of the Lord, to pick up your weapons and flee. For God has given the Here's the deal. At what point do we ever think that the devil can become in charge? Just because you're in a wilderness does not put him in charge. 
In fact, I've come specifically to preach before I leave and tell you he has showed up in your wilderness to try and convince you God is done with you. But I'm telling you, God is not done with you. God is going to prove himself. He's trying to prove himself in a new way to somebody here today. I wish somebody that's in the middle of a wilderness would stand up right where you're at and say, that's it, that's it. I'm gonna let God get the glory out of this. I'm gonna let God get the praise out of this. I'm asking somebody that the finances, the bills aren't paid. I need you to stand and lift your voice and lift your hands and say, God, you're gonna get the glory. Somebody that's in the middle of a marriage situation, I want you to tell him, God, you're going to get the glory. Stand with me. He wants the wilderness to make you bitter. But I'm telling you, the fruit of the vine never tastes as sweet as it did. Until you've spent some season without it. That's why fasting is so good for us, ladies and gentlemen. Fasting is so necessary for our flesh. It puts our flesh under subjection, telling our flesh, you're not going to be the boss of me. Well, let the Spirit lead me. Let the Spirit direct me. Let the Spirit guide me. When you fast, when you push away the plate, when you push away the food, when you get away from it for a little bit, you get, you get subject to the Spirit. Ooh, boy, I just hit a little nerve in the Spirit right there. I want you to throw your hands towards heaven. Ooh. If you can't remember the last time you went on a fast, I feel a challenge in this room right now. How could I go on a fast, Pastor? I'm in a wilderness. I'm in a wilderness, Pastor. Jesus seemed to prove that one of the greatest times too fast was in a wilderness. So that when the enemy shows up and tries to pull you out, of what was Satan trying to do with Christ? He was trying to pull him out of purpose. doing what he had always tried to do make him subservient try to make him lesser than same thing the Bible reveals that he tried to do before he was fallen make God lesser when that, when that great prophecy from Isaiah had come forward that he would be the mighty God and now Jesus is walking the earth with with all power, he would later say, in heaven and in earth, he's walking through. And the enemy shows up after he's driven into the wilderness. And this temptation begins. Man, I can't get away from this. I don't know who I'm talking to right here, but, but I'm, 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 I'm right in the middle. I know I'm right in the middle of your spiritual business right now. I'm talking to somebody. You feel like you're in a wilderness and the enemy has shown up. I want to tell you today, the fact that he knows where you're at and is working so hard is because you are so close to having the greatest testimony. <laughs> of course he wants you to give up. Of course he wants you to give in. If you don't give up and if you don't give in, there's no telling how many people are going to find freedom from your testimony. Today's altar is unique. It's not for everybody. Everybody she needs to pray where you're at. But I need people honest enough. If you're in the balcony, I want you to go to the middle if you're here, unless you just want to come downstairs and you can. If you're on the main level, I want you to come find somewhere in the altar if you'd be honest enough to say, I'm in a, I'm in a wilderness. It's not because you've done anything wrong. It's not because you've, I'm not saying it, it's not because you've, you've just, you've been in a wilderness. 
and you're ready for the Lord to see you out of this season. I'm calling for you. I want every hand lifted, every eye closed. Those that have been in a wilderness, I want you to draw strength from those that are already coming, but I want you to come down to the altar if you feel so compelled. Come all the way down to the very front. I don't want you to be embarrassed. I don't want you to be, the Lord's gonna strengthen you here today. We're gonna do something very specific here in a moment, but I want, I want you to come all the way. You don't know what decisions to make. Boy, I feel this right now. You don't know what decisions. I don't even know what, what's the decision. What am I supposed to? I don't know. I don't know the answer. If I've ever felt this heaviness, I feel it right now. Somebody in this altar saying, I don't even know what the step is. The greatest purpose of the wilderness was to prove the absolute necessity of God. That was the greatest purpose of the wilderness. The greatest purpose of the wilderness. The Israelites had to have God or they couldn't make it. John the Baptist, his, mess, his entire message of the wilderness was the exaltation of the Lord and the announcing of the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ in the wilderness, the entirety of the purpose was the denial of flesh to the purpose of the exaltation of God and to the will of God. There's people all over this altar, probably a hundred different people or so in this altar. I want everybody in the crowd to look at me. I need you right now. If I've ever needed the crowd, the church. If God has brought you through a wilderness, like really, you know, you can remember a season where your mind was so overwhelmed. Your spirit, you didn't know what the next move was. But God kept you and guided you and brought you out of that. If that's you and you can remember one of those seasons, I want you to slip out of your pew. I want you to come find somebody up here in this altar. And I want the church to be the church right now. Those that are in the altar, I want you to lift your hands. People are gonna come find you and begin to pray with you. The church is gonna begin to pray with you. I know you don't know what to do. I know you don't know what else to say. I know you're not sure what else to give. But your answer is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's making ways in the wilderness.